Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at Lincoln Hills Community Church. If you're here for the first time, second time, third time, or you've been here since the church started, we're glad you're here. Thanks for being here to worship with us this morning. If you are here uh, and you're a visitor and you've never given us uh, any of your information, like your address or phone number, we'd love for you to pass that on to us. Uh, we'd love to send you some information about the church. We won't come knock on your door and bother you. Just let you know who we are. Our altar flowers this morning are provided by Bob and Joanne Logan in celebration of their 65th <laughs> wedding anniversary. All right. They're all the way in the back back there. All the way in the back. There you go. God bless you guys, 65 years. This morning, uh, after the morning service, we're going to be having one of our uh, Welcome to LHCC seminars, and uh, that'll, be, that'll be started about 11.30. That'll give you time to uh, get out in the foyer, get a cup of coffee, fill your pockets and your purses with cookies and all the goodies, <laughs> and, and bring them into the class. And uh, we'll get started right around 11.30. And if you're here this morning and you didn't even know about it, you didn't sign up, that's okay. Grab some cookies and coffee and come on back anyway. We'll be in room 122, all the way out the sanctuary here, through the lobby, through the other double doors, behind the library. You can't miss us. We'll, we'll be standing around somewhere. So hopefully you'll uh, enjoy that and uh, learn a little bit more about who we are. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in our program this morning. I'm not going to outline all of them. Uh, one of the things I do want to mention, though, is uh, the movie night on the 4th of July. Uh, we're going to be uh, watching Paul the Apostle of Christ, that movie. And I understand that we're going to be having hot dogs and Togo's subs. So there you go. That might entice you to be there. Uh, barbecued hot dogs. That's even better. So it's not just boiled hot dogs, we're having barbecued. All right. Do they get a bun? They do get a bun. See? Folks, you, you can't miss this. <laughs> That's... I'm not going to tell you what Pastor Mike just said about buns. But anyway, it's going to be a great night. Uh, you're going to want to be there. And then you can leave here after the movie and uh, go watch the fireworks. That'll be a great, great evening. Uh, lastly, uh, this coming Saturday at uh, 2 p.m., we're going to be having a celebration of life for Harvey Eulogion, and you are certainly all invited to that. We hope you will come out and celebrate Harvey's life. Hey, let's, uh, let's get ready for our worship service with some prayer. <coughs> Father, we thank you for this time to be here this morning and to worship and praise you. As I've said over and over and over, we could be anywhere in the world, but Father, we're here. We're here to worship, we're here to praise, and we're here for you to bless us. Let your Holy Spirit roam through this building this morning and touch each heart as you would have it be touched. All the songs, music, preaching, everything that we say and do this morning, we would ask that it's done for your honor, your glory, and your praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing, I know whom I have believed.
Good morning, one and all. Today we are doing responsive reading from Psalm 27, and it's about faith and resolve. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep us safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressions. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For the Lord, be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. Thank you so much for reading God's words with me today. And being in this church helps us see God's love for us all. God bless.
Thank you, choir. I just love it every week. Boy, they just add so much to my worship experience, and I thank God for them and for Karen, for all her leadership. As we come to our time of prayer and giving of our gifts to the Lord, let me remind you that as we enter into these summer months, that uh, it's important for us to continue in our discipline of giving to the Lord because ministry still goes on during the summer and it's important for us. I'm reminded 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 to 18 says to us, we're to be joyful always. That's, uh, that's an easy thing to do when I come here. You just guys all make me joyful. But it also says, pray continually, always giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, on Sunday morning when we come together, you know, we sing and we, we listen to the sermon and we hope it won't be too dull. We hope, you know, J.R. will have a couple jokes or something like that, you know. But you know, one of the most important things we do is pray. Now, I know I stand up here and I pray and, you know, you listen. And, uh, but I want to remind all of us, we all are engaged in this moment of prayer. And uh, this morning, I want to share with you a number of prayer requests folks that need our prayers. One of them is Richard Hall. Richard and Jerry have been longtime members here, but not been able to be out of recent. And Rich has been in an assisted living home, and uh, now he's at home under hospice and probably doesn't have a long time. Be praying for him and for God's you know, grace and mercy for him, but especially for Jerry as she's got to care for him. Dick Basinger, who just joined recently here with his wife Marie, they haven't been able to be with us yet because he's been in and out of the hospital. I saw him yesterday. He's doing much better. We'll keep praying for him. And then there's Ed Bader. Ed, Ed is here today. God bless you, Ed. You were back in the hospital last week, and it's great to see you here. Please keep praying for Sherry Walker. Sherry's right down here. She's going through another round of uh, infusions, chemotherapy. So let's really remember her in prayer. And Dick Schaefer. Dick is here this morning, and I know he started his... his uh, infusions this week and I know he doesn't feel the greatest but God bless your brother I'm so glad you're here and uh, another lady Kay Stitt had a fall broke her shoulder we want to remember her and then Carolyn Domer is back there I mean uh, she just kicked something with her knee well actually she fell I told Carolyn that's all right I kicked my desk with my knee and she broke her kneecap mine just hurt, hurt like the Dickens but we pray for you Carolyn this morning Two special people I want you to pray for on, Thursday, on Tuesday this week. One of them is Thelma Larson, is right over here. And in a minute, I'm going to go over there, and Mike Cox and I are going to go over there, and we're going to pray for her. And the other one is Bob Murdoch, one of our elders, and we're going to have Jr. and a couple of our elders come over and pray for him. Both of these people are going through procedures. Bob will be going through open-heart surgery. Thelma will be going through a procedure. They're not doing open heart on her yet, but they are correcting a valve, and so we really want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask JR if you'll go over and a couple of guys gather around uh, Bob, and then uh, I'll come over here. The Thelma and Mike is going to come with you. Keep my mic. It's not working? No, they're not. I have, I'm not turned on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in trouble now because I'm turned on. <laughs> <laughs> testing testing go ahead first all right let's just lay our hands on him father you are the god of the universe amen you have each one of us in your hands you made us you created us you know every fiber of our being we pray that you would be with our brother this tuesday when he goes into this surgery that you will give him confidence you will give him encouragement and just a, a knowing that you are there with him and in control of everything be with the surgeons guide their hands father we know they've done it many many times but it would it would make us feel better if you were there with them lord mm -hmm. to help them and guide them we love this dear brother and his family his dear wife carol and uh, pray that you would be with her and keep her from being too anxious during the surgery time. Father, all we can do is love them and pray for them. We'll leave the rest of it 
in your hands. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless Father, you. today we come and we, we bring your dear daughter here, Thelma. Lord, she's such a sweet lady, and, and she goes in for this procedure on Tuesday. We pray that you, first of all, just give her a real peace and uh, help her to know you're the God of all mercies and the God of all comfort, and you're there comforting her. Lord, uh, guide the doctors and let them uh, make this correction and to the valve that needs to be uh, uh, whatever it is they do, Lord, and so that she would not have to go any further with an open heart or anything. Just take care of her, Lord, and she's in your hands, and I pray that you just let her know she feels herself in your hands. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, as we continue to pray today, there are a lot of our folks here that uh, they've gone through some things and several people, Father, that are going through chemotherapy and infusions. I especially pray for Dick. I pray for his comfort, for his strength. And I pray, Father, that, uh, that you would ease any of the the sick feeling and the illness that sometimes you experience after the infusion and that you would take care of him. Father, give just a real peace to his wife, Pat. And Father, for Sherry, I pray for her as she continues to go through these, uh, these treatments. And Lord, many others, we pray for Jerry Hall as she ministers to her husband, Dick. It, it looks, Lord, like soon you'll be taking him home. And I I pray, Lord, that you make that passage not only easy, but glorious for him. God, many others, even that we haven't mentioned this morning, that you, God, would just touch their bodies. Watch over this church. Let the joy of the Lord continue to be felt in all of our lives. And out of that joy comes the peace of God that passes all understanding. Now we give our gifts to you today, Lord, and let us be generous and let us be responsive and joyous in our giving as we realize all that you do for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
For those of you who are visiting, I want to say we don't always do it that way, but we, we, we feel it inside, I'll tell you that. Amen. That's why I love this church. It is so much fun. You know, it's not that way in every church, you know. Somebody once said there's some churches you could ice skate down the center aisle, you know. And, <laughs> and, and some Christians that I've known, they, they look like they were weaned on a pickle, you know. <laughs> that isn't true in this church, I can tell you that. Wow. Ladies, thank you. That was the delight. And Karen, your leadership is what produces all of this stuff. And you're a joy to work with. God bless you. And I want you to remember her in prayer this week, you know, because uh, she's, she's got to go through that journey, too, because she's had to say goodbye to Harv, and uh, she's just a great lady of faith, and I appreciate her and all that the choir and all of you do. It's just, wow, what a blessing. And, and we get to work here, don't we? Ah, goodness. I get to listen to his jokes. <laughs> Of course, he steals them from me, but that's all right. <laughs> well, I have an announcement for you. Did you know there's only 29 and a half more weeks until Christmas? This is crazy. Give it about another four or five weeks, and you'll start seeing it in Costco, too, you know. And oh, my. But, you know, Christmas time, we come to that event of the birth of Christ, and... Uh, even though we look at it at Christmas time, it's something that ought to be so real to us all through the year. The interesting thing was that not everybody understood, comprehended what was going on at that point in time, but there were people who understood. Who were some of those people? Well, some of those people were obviously Joseph and Mary. They, they understood. All the depths of it, only gradually. And then there was Elizabeth and Zechariah. You know, Mary went to her sister or her cousin, Elizabeth, and Zechariah was a priest, so she went to stay with them when she first found out that she was with child. They understood. The shepherds, of course, they understood because the angels announced it to them. And the magi understood. Now, these guys were pagans, but God had revealed some things to them. And, of course, Simeon. Somebody the other day said to me, Herod understood, but, yeah, but Herod really got it wrong. It was all a threat to him. But Simeon, now this is an important guy, and he'll enter in here in a few minutes, but right along Simeon, with Simeon was another lady that we're going to look at today, and that is Anna. She's the next lady, great lady of faith. I asked you last week how many knew about Hannah, and there's not a lot of you knew about Hannah in the Old Testament. Well, you might remember the name Anna, because it's in the Christmas narrative, but you probably don't know much about her. In fact, some of you probably wouldn't have even been to able to tell me about Anna. But, you know, there's three verses, just three verses that are about her. But it's extraordinary when you get into the backstory, if you will. Most of us read through the scriptures and we, da 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 okay, Anna, who she, who she was. But it's when you get into the background, the backstory, it's amazing. It's so exciting. And that's what I want to share with you today. This was a tremendous lady of faith. Not the one we usually think of. I mean, there's all kinds of others like Sarah. We think of her, well, we think Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, uh, and there's some others. But this little lady, three verses, it's incredible what's in, in those verses. But let me take you through a little bit. We're going to go back a little bit to Luke 22, 25, because the first guy, before you taught, introduced to Anna, you're introduced to this man, Simeon. It says, there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, who was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's an important statement, the consolation of Israel. And I'll explain it a little more in a moment. And the Holy Spirit was on him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he's coming to the temple all these years, hoping that he would see the Lord's anointed, the one that he was going to send that would be the consolation, the hope of Israel. It was this man who said, Lord, he came. Mary and Joseph came to the temple. They're dedicating the child. And somehow the Holy Spirit revealed to him, he says, that's, that's who you're waiting for. 
And he comes up to the couple. I, I, I can imagine when I was walking out of the hospital with our firstborn as some from elderly gentleman came up to me and took my child and started praising God. I wondered what was going on. But Mary and Joseph stood there, and, and the old gentleman took him, and he said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. In Latin, nunc dimittis, there's a, song, there's a hymn to that, a carol to that name. You now dismiss your servant in peace. Why? Because my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light of revelation, first to the Gentiles, and second for the glory to your people Israel. That's kind of leads up now to Anna. Well, Anna's there in the temple, and she hears him speaking. So here we come to Anna. There was also a prophet, Anna was her name a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and I'll talk about that all in a minute, but she was very old. She'd lived with her husband seven years, and probably she was about, oh, roughly 16, 17 when she got married. That was usually when they got married, seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow, and she was a widow until she was 84 years old. 60 years she had been a widow, and she never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. And she came up to them at that very moment. She heard Simeon saying what he said, and she gave thanks to God, and she kept on speaking about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And that's the story of Anna, just three verses, but it's incredible. So if we're going to understand the faith of this woman, we need to understand a couple of things, a little bit of background. What fueled the popular expectations of that day? I mean, we have our own expectations of Christmas. Will I just get through it, you know, fiscally solvent, you know? But, but when Jesus was born, the, the expectations, the fervency were at an all-time height. Well, what, what were common people expecting? Well, one of them... They were expecting the end of Gentile rule. Now, we need to understand a little bit about this. Isaiah, clear back about 700 years before, made this statement. He said, now I will tell you what I'm going to do. He's speaking for the Lord. To my vineyard. Who's the vineyard? It's Israel. I will take away its hedge, my protection, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls, and it will be trampled. Jerusalem, at that point, well, Jesus later, in, in his statement about coming things, he says, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When did that all start? It started clear back in Isaiah's day with the rise of the Babylonian Empire. Actually, the Assyrian Empire invaded, and they, we'll see in a few moments, they absolutely destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah was the southern with Jerusalem in the capital. I'll show you a little bit in a moment. But from that point on, through the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and now presently, when they're coming to the birth of Jesus, the Roman Empire is there. And you know what, folks? The truth of the matter is, when you get to the book of Revelation, you find out that they're still dominated by the Gentiles. And you say, oh, well, but Israel's back in the land. They have their land. Yeah, they do. You know who let them go there? The Gentiles. 1948, the United Nations said they can go back. And within about a year or so, they sing in a different tune. And you know today that all world po politics and uh, any political uh, system or approach to the Middle East, it all focuses on Israel. Yeah, they have their land, but they're there in unbelief. And they're there because the Gentile world Still running things. And when you get to the final days before Jesus comes, the whole Gentile world is just focused on destroying Israel. Then Jesus comes. But they, they were looking forward to the end of this time of the Gentiles. Well, another thing, along with it, they were hoping the reestablishment of the Davidic kingdom. That's important. Way back in 2 Samuel, God revealed to the prophet Nathan to David, David, you're not going to build the temple. You're a man of blood. Your son Solomon will build the temple. However, David, this is my promise, and this is one of the most important promises in the Old Testament. Your house and your kingdom 
will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. It's the promise of the Davidic kingdom. Now, when Jesus was being born, that was on the mind of all of these Jewish people. We're tired of the Roman rule, the Gentiles. They're, they're hoping that God now is going to send the deliverer and he, the, we're going to go back to the glory days of David. Well, and, and in fact, when the angel announced to Mary the birth of Jesus, this is what he said. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and his kingdom will never end. Now, if you remember, Joseph and Mary are both from the line of David. That's why they were going back to Bethlehem. It was the city of David to register. This was God's promise. People were hoping that was coming to completion now. Interesting, when Jesus, this is 33 years later, when Jesus rides in on what we call Palm Sunday, what were the crowd singing? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. They were believing that when Jesus rode there into Jerusalem, he's the conqueror and he is the son of David. We're going back to the glory days. And within about four or five days, they were all yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Because they realized he wasn't going to take them back. They were looking for the wrong thing. They were also looking for the coming of Elijah. You know, you know Passover. Today, if you were in an Orthodox Jewish home observing Passover, there would be one chair at the table that's empty. There'd be a place prepared for him, but nobody sits there. And a child may ask, what's the chair, what's the empty place for? And the parents would answer, this is for Elijah. Because in Malachi 4, 5, it says, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And then they're looking for the 70 weeks of Daniel. We've looked at this in the past, and I'm not going to go through everything about it today. But this is one of the most important timetables in the Bible. It's in... It's in Daniel chapter 9. And they would be aware of it. And they would be counting, because I'll show you in a moment, they'd be counting off and, and realizing the time is right. The Messiah should be coming. And so they were expecting it. Well, Daniel 9 says, 77s are decreed for your people in your holy city. 77s are 490 years. There was a 490-year timetable. Well, what, what was going to happen? Well, that 490 years is decreed to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, and to bring everlasting righteousness. The last part of it is future yet. But those things in 400, actually it wasn't 490 years, because this is what he says. Know this and understand. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We know the timing of that. Are right? Xerxes of the Persians? allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and rebuild Jerusalem. Until the anointed one, the Messiah, comes, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. That's 483 years. And most of them could calculate that. And that takes them right up to around the time in their mind that Jesus is being born. So they're looking for the Messiah. Let me show you something here. It also says after the 62 sevens, he doesn't mention the other seven, but after the 69 years, basically 483 years, it says something. The anointed one, Messiah, will be what? What does it say? Cut off. Now look at this. If you look at the seven weeks plus the 62, what does that take us up to? It's the day that Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Palm Sunday. Well, what happens when he's cut off? That's when he's crucified. And, you know, they could add up numbers. They didn't get all this right. But, but that expectation of a conquering hero, something spectacular, they didn't understand what it meant when he said he was cut off. They had no idea about the crucifixion. But the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the donkey, boy, they thought, it's here. But they were even expecting it when he was born. So they were, they were looking for that. But they were looking for a conqueror. They weren't looking for the right thing. But people like Anna and Simeon were. Well, what kind of lady was this Lady Anna? And here's where we learn some tremendous things about faith. And this, this is, you know, a woman's faith. But guys, this is for us too. 
God included it in there because he wants us to learn from it. What kind of lady was she? She was a woman of God's word. What does it say? There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was a prophet or prophetess, if you want. Now, most of us think of a prophet, we're thinking of somebody who predicts the future. That's not the basic meaning of the word prophet. Some prophets did predict things. Daniel certainly did. But Daniel also did other things. A prophet was one who spoke forth the word of God. Essentially, Anna was a preacher. That's what prophets were. They declared the word of the Lord. They stood before kings fearlessly. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, all these men, above all else, they declared the word of God. And that's what, that's what we'll see in a few minutes, what Anna was. She was a woman of the word. What did she preach? Well, we get that from Simeon. Simeon, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Somebody asked me the other day, well, what, is, what does that mean, consolation? Does that mean Israel gets second place? You know, usually when I get the consolation prize, that means I didn't win, but I get something. No, consolation means comfort. And undoubtedly, in her mind, would have gone back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. I love Isaiah 40 because in the 31st verse, that's the verse that says that we will mount up. Uh, they that wait upon the Lord will what? Renew their strength, and they'll mount up with the wings of eagles, and they'll run and not be weary and walk and not faint. That's the end of the chapter. But that begins with these words. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. What's that comfort about? And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and that her sin has been paid for. What's the consolation of Israel about? It's about the end and the atonement for sin for the nation of Israel and for the world for that matter. It goes on in the second verse to say in very familiar words with now connects us with what's going to happen with Jesus. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the wilderness, a highway for God. Where do we hear those? Who quotes those verses? John the Baptist. Yes. 30 years later, after Jesus is born, as he begins his ministry, John is the Elijah who comes, and this is what he declares. I am one crying out of the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So that would have been in her mind. Paul wrote about it in Romans 10. He says, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? He's quoting there from Isaiah 53. And consequently, faith comes from hearing the word, the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. This lady was a lady of the word. And we'll see in a moment, she, she went about telling people what the consolation was all about. Well, she was also a woman of God's grace. Anna, incidentally, that's the Greek form of Hannah. Hannah's who we looked at last week. Anna's who we look at this week. The, the names are the Hebrew. Hannah is the Hebrew, and Anna is the Greek. But both names mean grace. This is a lady full of grace. There was also a prophet, Anna, and the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Those are important words, the tribe of Asher. Here's the thing. In 930 BC, David had united, he, he, he united the kingdom, he, he established Jerusalem, and then after him along comes Solomon, and they reached the zenith of Israel's greatness. They built that great Solomonic temple. Solomon rules for 40 years. Probably the first five years or so are pretty good. He's pretty godly, pretty wise, and then it all goes downhill from there. And he, he starts moving in pagan directions, and it was those... 700 wives that he had that got him into trouble. <laughs> now, he did it himself, but he took on a lot of pagan wives. And things really got bad. When he died, civil war broke out in 930 BC, and the kingdom split. Two tribes, there's the split, and two tribes in the south were Judah. Judah was one tribe, Benjamin was the other, so they called it Judah. Jerusalem was the capital. Then to the north were ten tribes, and they called them Israel. So sometimes when you're in the Old Testament, you'll hear Israel and Judah. That means the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Understand something. This is a horrible time, this period of history, for about the next 
400 years. The northern kingdom were the ten tribes. Sometimes you hear that phrase, the lost ten tribes of Israel. Well, they were the northern ones, and because in 722 B.C. it got so bad that God sent the Assyrians, and they took them into total captivity and never heard of again. But not a single king. When you start reading the kings and the chronicles, there's not one king in the north that's ever listed as good. They were just as evil and rotten and pagan as they come. In the south, it wasn't much better. There were a few kings that were godly, but most of them I wouldn't give a plug nickel for either. And eventually, they were carried into captivity by the Babylonians around the year 607 B.C. And here's the thing about Anna. She's from the tribe of Asher. That's those northern kingdoms. How do you get this godly woman out of that godless bunch that were to the north? Here's the thing, folks, and never forget this. No matter how bad we may think are, things are, God always says there's a remnant. I mean, maybe you remember Elijah in the Old Testament. He was so discouraged. Jezebel is after his hide. He's out there, you know, in the wilderness, and he's finally hiding in a cave, and God calls him out and he said, what's the matter with you? He says, Lord, I'm the only one in all of Israel, in all of Jerusalem that cares about you. And God says, shut up. Well, <laughs> says it a little more nicely in the text. But he says, listen up. There are 7,000 people who have not bowed down to the Baals. You're not the only one. There's always a remnant. And what happened was when the northern tribes got carried into captivity, the Assyrians left a few of them behind. And eventually, some of them, even during the days when things weren't so good, migrated to the south. Now, understand, when they did that, in the north is where they had their property, because the area was divided up. The tribes, each tribe had so much property. So you migrated to the south. You left everything. But they left the godlessness to find the, the God of Israel in Judah. And so, undoubtedly, Anna was part of that. She was a woman who experienced the grace of God. She was a woman, a family, a tribe that you never would have dreamed. Let me tell you something. Never think that somebody is so far gone that they're out of the reach of the grace of God. Isn't that great? This was Anna. Well, she was also a woman devoted to God's house, and this is where I get kind of excited. Listen to what it says. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. I love that about this lady. I wish I knew more about her. But I'll tell you what, when I list, think of her, I think of a dear lady in my very first church. Her name was Peggy. Peggy had to be in her late 60s, 70s. We had a, a kids program called Awana. How many of you know what Awana is? It's a, it's a fantastic kids program. And she would drive around at night, and she'd pick up kids and bring them. And then on Sunday, she'd drive around and pick up a lot of our senior citizens and bring them. Now, I, I heard later it was a little bit like being on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride with Peggy. But <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything she wouldn't do for the Lord. Then I heard her story. One day I visited with her. And amazing story. As a young lady, she really felt called of God to serve. And she was going to seminary. And, and she was following God's call. Problem was, her husband wasn't. And he left her. In that day and age, going through a divorce that just ended any hope she had of ministry, there wasn't going to be any mission agency that would have taken her on. Probably no church. So I, I said, what did you do? She said, well, I simply determined that I would serve the Lord in the house of the Lord the rest of my life. And that's exactly what she did. Oh, she worked some until her retirement years. But I'll tell you, I never saw anybody. She must have had been, <laughs> she must have had the Energizer bunny in her jeans someplace. Because she was just terrific. But for this lady, she was married to the Lord. That's Anna. She lost her husband. But the Lord was her husband. And she, she wanted to do nothing but serve in the temple of the Lord. 
You know, a little while ago this morning, Sybil read that passage we all read together in Psalm 27, and I've got to believe that Anna somehow had those words in her mind. Do you remember what it said? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then the next words. One thing I ask from the Lord. This is all I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Peggy quoted those verses to me. I think Anna knew them very well. She loved the house of God. Well, the last thing is a woman proclaiming God's message. Look at what it says. When it was done and she heard this, she went out, she, the words she, she spoke, went about speaking, it means she kept on. You couldn't shut her up. She kept on speaking about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. You can imagine what she said. I'm sure the words of, of Simeon would have come to her mind, and she would have said something like this. My eyes also have seen the Lord's salvation, prepared in the sight of all people. The Lord's salvation is for the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. That's an interesting statement, that last part. Because you know, in the temple, of course they had the Holy of Holies, then the holy place, then the, where they'd have the altar, and then they'd have another court, the court of the men, and then the, one of, then the court of the women, and the outermost court was the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could go up in the temple, but they could not go beyond the wall. In fact, they have found the plaque that says, he who goes beyond this point, Gentile goes beyond this point, does so at the peril of his life. But they had a place for the Gentiles, even in the temple. And she understood what that meant. She said, the Lord's salvation is for the Gentiles and the glory for the people of Israel. Jesus died for the sins of all men. Gentile, Jew, slave, free, man, woman, evil, good. I like to say to people, there is no one in the face of the earth today who has not had his sins paid for. There are only people who haven't embraced it and accepted it. It says in John 1, 12, to all, what? To all who believed in him, he gave the gift, the privilege of becoming the children of God. All who received him, that is, to all who believed in his name. It's available to everybody, and she understood that. I want to wind this up by telling you a story that lots of you know. How many of you know have heard of Corey Ten Boom? Did you ever see the movie Hiding Place? What a powerful movie. I think, I think we need to show that here one of these days. It's a great story. If you know about Corey Ten Boom, she was born 1892. With the coming of World War II, with the Nazi invasion of Holland in 1942, well, actually a little earlier than that, her father, they lived in Holland. They were watchmakers, godly family. She, she was 50 years old. She had never married. And what they did was hide Jews. Everywhere the Nazis went, they hunted down the Jews and shipped them out to concentration camps. But this family began hiding them, hence the word, the, the book, The Hiding Place. If you've ever read that, you really should. It's a great book. And they, they got along for quite a while, hiding the Jews in their attic. And then they were discovered, and the whole family was sent off to a concentration camps. They all died, with the exception of her. She went to uh, Ravensbrook with her sister, Betsy, and uh, Betsy died of typhus. She managed to come through it. And from that point on, the rest of her life, she became a lot like Anna, proclaiming the word of God. In fact, one day uh, down south where I, where I lived before I came here, uh, near Orange, I was doing a funeral one day over in the cemetery, and I came across her grave. There it was. She, she died at the age of 90. I love some of the things she said, and I'm going to leave these with you today. Anna was a lady of faith, so was this lady, but her words challenge all of us. One of the things she used to say is, I know from experience that God's light is stronger than man's biggest darkness. She knew from experience. She lived through that concentration camp. She watched her sister die, and when she got out, everybody in the family was gone. She used to say this, I love this statement, there's no hole so deep that Jesus Christ isn't deeper. 
Amen? Absolutely. And you can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. I think she surely knows that. But here's the one I love most, and I want to leave you with it today. I don't know if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope you do. That's what this is all about, is coming to God, to the friendship with God, because you believe his son died for your sins. You may not understand all the theology of it, but you understand that you're not perfect, that you are a sinful person, and someday you're going to meet a God who's going to appraise things. The gospel is that Jesus came and provided the answer for you. Here's what Corey Ten Boom said. I love this. She's quoting Psalm 103. God takes our sins past, present, and future and dumps them in the sea and puts up a sign. No fishing allowed. I love that. That's great. God bless you, Corey. When I get to heaven, I'm going to tell you, thank you, no fishing allowed. Psalm 103, verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he taken our sins from us and cast them into the sea. And you can never go fishing there again. Oh, the devil wants to take you fishing. But God says, you can't go there. There's no more fish here, not for you. You go fishing here, it just stinks. So do your sins, but I've cast them into the sea. And you're here today, and you're wanting to have that kind of peace and joy in the Lord. You want that friendship with God. This is the answer. Christ died for sins. The just for the unjust. So he could bring us to God. My prayer for you today is that you let God bring, bring you to him. Let Jesus Christ, he's done everything that needs to be done. You never have to go fishing again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for the faith of this woman, Anna. There's just three verses, Lord, but there's so much there. She's an example of what faith is all about. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when it comes to us, the grace of God invades our lives, takes our sins and casts them into the sea and never lets us go fishing again. And then God... In his place come the peace and the joy and the righteousness and the joyfulness. God, that we can't help but radiate it and can't help answer people when they ask us, why are you so happy? What's the reason for the hope you have? And we can say, glad you asked. Let me just tell you what happened to me. Lord, thank you for Anna. And thank you, Father, for the salvation you give to us. And if there's someone here today that is on that journey to the cross and they're struggling getting there, somehow by your Holy Spirit today, even as you did with Anna and so many others that we read about in the Bible, let the Holy Spirit simply speak to them today. In the words of God, I love you. And nothing will take you away from me if you'll just receive what I want to give to you. God bless us. Our faith, it looks up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us together, and that's the song we're going to sing this morning. My faith looks up to you as we close. Great to have you all here today, and if you're here for the first time, may the Lord bless you. I hope you come back. It's been a joy for us just to have you here today.
Almighty God, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, truly, that one thing we desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Thank you, O God, that the Holy Spirit gives us glimpses of that glory. And oh, thank you that we can be here in the house of the Lord together and the joyfulness and the peace that you give to us. Oh, thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.